I, I, I'm so excited about our speaker tonight that I feel like we should maybe get on with it. I think so too. So would you like to spotlight our speaker and then we can start interacting with him? I will. Here, here, can you hear me? Yeah, okay, we hear you, we see you. Yeah, I speak, uh, I guess you'll see me again. And uh, if you don't mind, I'm gonna leave my home office and uh, jump into the metaverse uh, so that I can speak to you from a, a, a nicer environment. How about now? Ah, okay, all right. Everything has now appeared in Harvard. Yes. All right, so all right. that's fantastic. We see you at the podium. We see you on the big screen uh, in the auditorium. So this is all perfect. And why don't we start to introduce you while you're already there on stage? It, well, I got all these screens to look at. All right, so, um, all right, so let me say first, um, I, I'm very excited about the opening of, of the series. And I'm also very excited that Igo Sigal, Ido Sigal is joining us. He is, I don't, you can't fully know like where to start on a bio like this, but um, I'll just start with like level one, he's a serial entrepreneur. And, and this is maybe his sixth company that he started. And, um, and he is, basically an expert in like this combined set of spaces that includes um, AI, it includes media and web, it includes today what is mixed reality, and it includes like all the design principles. And then you just kind of put all those things together and you might even think of this as the future of the web plus AI, you know, like all of these things that have been evolving. He's kind of synthesizing them and bringing them all together. Um, and um, it's never easy to know where exactly he's joining from because of his virtual nature. Are you at Harvard or are you not, you know, whichever. But anyway, you know, we're really, um, really excited that you are the first speaker of this series. And, uh, and we're really looking forward to seeing like the, the types of things that you're doing and to try to extrapolate from that what you know the way the world will be in the future. So with that, if it's okay, I'm going to hand it over to you. But we do need to spotlight Ido yeah. because he's not up on the screen yet. As soon as I speak, uh, you'll be seeing me. All right. Okay, you're up. I'm going to sit down, and the floor is yours. Terrific. Thank you so much, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to, to speak to all these bright minds. And we live in incredibly exciting times. And uh, I, what I'd like to try to accomplish in this short session is try to demystify some of the trends we're all experiencing because we are going through somewhat of a revolution together uh, these days, uh, which is a combination of the work of so many people uh, for so many years. Uh, and it, it is going to be at the scale of, I believe, similar to the industrial revolution. And I will unpack the, the, those bold statements by virtue of sharing with you some of the vision of what we're up to at Touchcast, the company I, I now lead, I've uh, had the privilege of working with some incredible people over the years, uh, both in the teams that I've led, but also collaborating with, with some of the, the, the leaders in the industry, whether it's Steve Jobs or uh, George Lucas or amazing musicians like Will I Am and just amazing minds. And, and really the, the way to succeed is to find position yourself in this path with other amazing people. So that, and your journey is uh, learning and, and networking to the point, it really is important to create those bonds and, and travel together because it really is a force multiplier, I think. So I think you saw me uh, a second ago uh, talking to you from, from Harvard, uh, but what we do at TouchCast is really lead in this, uh, what we refer to as the enterprise metaverse. We work very closely with Microsoft uh, and other leading companies like Accenture on allowing companies to move into this world. So for example, uh, here you can see me uh, in what is a, a showroom for the Fiat uh, cars, which we just showcased at CES. And Fiat is actually selling cars in the metaverse using this technology. And I'll show you a quick demo of that in a second. But generally speaking, I want to point out that what we're experiencing now is a fundamental uh, revolution on the web. You've, you've heard of the term Web3, uh, the movement from Web2, and you've heard of the term metaverse. But uh, the term metaverse, I believe, has uh, been abused a bit. So I, I want to focus on what I feel is the metaverse and what I feel this transition is. So if you look at the world that we've all grown up in, 
which is the Web2 era, uh, we've grown up in a world where the internet has represented this massive library, this library uh, of all of human knowledge uh, that exists as web pages. And web pages are effectively the equivalent of print artifacts. Think of it like a massive library. It's much bigger than any library we had before, but just like the Alexandrian library in ancient Egypt, it is still a library with fixed uh, artifacts that contain and encode knowledge uh, on shelves. Those shelves are digital now. And we've lived through this revolution powered by Google where our children now have all of the information in their finger. Uh, tips because they can search that massive library. But what's occurring right now is a transition from a world of encoded knowledge, a synchronous knowledge, into a world of generative knowledge. And that's a fundamental shift. And that is what uh, you're seeing with things like uh, chat GPT, because when you're retrieving information or knowledge, you're not finding the book on the shelf and the right chapter and the right page but rather you're speaking to an entity that's so smart that has read all those books and can articulate the answer to your question um, in a way that is unique. Just like if you met a very smart person, like one of your professors, and you asked them a question on Monday, and you would ask them the same question on Thursday, uh, they would give you uh, a different answer, hopefully <laughs> the same information, but phrased differently. And that's what's happening in this world where we move from encoding things in volumes of text to encoding them in neural networks and through uh, inference. And th this is a fundamental revolution that is going to have the same impact. Uh, if you were a loom worker during the age of uh, the Industrial Revolution, you had a hard time when looms became mechanized. Mm -hmm. And this technology is uh, fundamentally uh, attacking every knowledge work that we do. Uh, and I'm talking about whether you're a programmer or you are a poet. Um, uh, and everything in between um, is all effectively being challenged by these technologies. And that creates both a massive opportunity and a massive displacement. And I think you kind of have to really understand and spend time and energy uh, understanding this transition to make it into a superpower for yourself and for the people around you, as opposed for it to be a threat to your future. So there are kind of two sides of this spectrum. Uh, on one side, uh, for example, uh, my older son, who's now doing his uh, degree in college, was just told last week that they are canceling all essays and papers. They are no longer going to accept papers because they are concerned about the risk that ChatGPT uh, poses and the fact that students can now write their papers using ChatGPT. That's one side of the spectrum. Uh, on the other side of the spectrum, a conversation I recently had with a leading uh, CEO uh, of, a, of a technology company, I asked him, if a developer comes to you and shows you working code, and then he tells you, I use ChatGPT to write this code, do you fire that person or do you promote them? And his response was, well, of course I promote them because what they've demonstrated is the ability to be nimble and to adapt. And the one thing that is a constant, if you choose to have a life that's in the technology space or attached to it, is you have to have a constant state of adaptation because technology changes all the time. Uh, you have to constantly uh, retain a core of knowledge and understanding, but constantly reimagine and reinvent yourself and the, the things around you. And those that do that uh, can boast a career of repeat failure, to your point earlier, and success. And those that don't will find it very hard to have a fulfilling career in this space. So I think this idea that you would tell your students not to use this technology is almost criminal because that's the world that they are now living in. And ChatGPT is simply the first generation of, uh, of almost like a beta or an alpha of what's coming very quickly in chat in GPT-4, GPT-5, GPT-6, et cetera. So having given you that background, I want to show you an actual industrial use case for how these technologies manifest in the world uh, of industry. Specifically, we're going to look at the automotive industry. Uh, and the reason we started at the automotive industry, even though we're engaged in retail and pharmaceutical and education, many others, is that they already have the notion of a digital twin of their core product, which is the cars, because cars are made in CAD, right? So they already have configurators. So let me show you this five minute demo. And if you were in Las Vegas at CS, CS being the biggest trade show in the world, we were actually showing in the Microsoft booth. And if you were to happen to stray by, 
You might have seen me uh, enthusiastically trying to convey why the car industry is never going to be the same again. And let me share this quick demonstration with you. So the, the big milestone we have is uh, all the companies here go through a massive reinvention with electrification. Is also an opportunity to reshape the way they connect to their consumers. In the past, uh, if you think of how we bought cars, it was these beautiful glossy brochures. And in the early 2000s, they became these websites, which are basically a brochure. You need to read the text. You need to process a lot of information. People don't read anymore. What if this could become an uh, experience that instantly you're inside something that's more like a commercial? And this is what you're seeing here. This is the Fiat homepage where you're actually seeing what is a live commercial. As you're watching it, you can change from day to night. You can effectively change the color of the vehicle. You're already on a buying journey. And this does not require any software to be installed. It does not require any VR headset. This is just working in the Chrome browser, which is remarkable. Uh, now, once you want to continue this process and maybe you have some questions, this is where incredible artificial intelligence comes in. We partnered with OpenAI and Microsoft to develop, if you've probably heard of ChatGPT, created manual GPT. Now, most cars come with these big books. This is a 300 plus page book for that little car, which we'll never look at because it'll be in your glove compartment. But what if you could just ask a question and the AI will find the answer for you? So let's see an example here. Does this car have regenerative braking? Anytime the driver lifts their foot from the accelerator pedal, the car will slow down and recover kinetic energy. This is used to generate electric power and recharge the battery. That is a synthetic avatar generated with AI, and it basically can create an answer for any question you have that's contained in this book, which is absolutely re remarkable. How many of you have forgotten the tire pressure? You know, these things are usually require a lot of effort. Now it's, just, it's always a click away. And if that's not enough, if you haven't found the answer to your question by interacting with this magnificent AI, you can click on the questions button or get design yours and we'll be flying into a dealership that's populated by a real dealer sales personnel from the OEM. Hello. Hello, welcome to the Fiat Metaverse store. My name is Tim, how can I help you guys today? Tim, are you real? I'm a real person. I exist. And I'm actually not very far away from you guys physically either. Okay. I'm not convinced, but we'll see. Uh, can, can I see this car in rose gold? We can. That's actually one of our more popular colors. Oh, beautiful. That's really nice. Does, there's their version where the roof opens? Uh, yes. So the Fiat 500 lineup has uh, three models. The Cabrio is the model you're referencing. And let me quickly show you what that looks like when I open the roof. Oh, nice. So this is a fabric top. Very nice. It is, and it's just easy, simple, one click open, one click to close. So we're in the browser. I can also interact. I don't have a mouse in my hand, but I can change the colors. I can change the packages as we go through this process. Um, and for many consumers moving to electric vehicles, they have a lot of questions. For example, Tim, um, how do I charge my car? Yeah, it's a great question. So we actually created a bit of an animation here to help you better understand that, because a lot of people I'm speaking to, it's their first time buying an EV. So the charging is actually pretty easy. It's simple to very simple, uh, uh, pretty intuitive. The charger itself can actually be plugged into your standard outlet in your wall. If you want a faster charger, we call that level two charging. We can have an electrician come do that as part of your package. Uh, but just to clarify, you don't need anything special. We can actually use that existing charger you have on your wall uh, with the standard charger. So I literally like charging my laptop. Exactly. Wonderful. And what if I'm driving around and I want to power, get some tap up my battery? How do I? How do I do that? Yeah, it's a good question. So all of that is managed within our dashboard. So you'll see here the battery levels. So this will actually give you a notification when you're running low, and then it'll actually route you to some of the closer charging stations nearby. I got it. So I just click that drive button and I'm off, right? Exactly. So if any of you have been involved in marketing, you know that producing a video looks this stunning, takes many weeks, if not months, hundreds of thousands of dollars, and a big effort like a studio. But in fact, everything you're seeing is happening live. And let me show you how it's done. If we go around the corner for a second, we'll see where Tim is actually in his office. Let's go and say hello. So here you can see, if you keep going here, you'll see his screen as well. Hello, Tim everybody. is in his home office. Welcome to my uh, fishbowl. On the screen, you can see that he's simply on a Microsoft Teams call. So he literally just joins a Teams call. There is no green screen. There is no special equipment. He has a webcam there. You can see the interface. You must have been on many Teams calls during the pandemic. And here you can see that he's simply transporting himself into this amazing showroom 
Just like you can schedule a meeting in a conference room, you can now schedule a meeting in the metaverse using metaverse as a service from TouchCast. So let's go back here. Now, as I'm speaking with Tim, everything that I'm saying is getting transcribed by Azure uh, Cognitive Services, which allows the AI to support him. So if I say something like, I heard this car can park itself, is that true? That automatically triggers the relevant content from the system. The salesperson doesn't need to do anything. And in fact, it can actually support their knowledge. So if I ask them a question that they're not familiar with, like, uh, Tim, what's the range of this car? Yeah, so the Fiat 500 EV uh, has a range of about 250 kilometers uh, or about 150 miles. So he's reading that off the screen because it was triggered based on what I said. So it's really an incredible revolution to move this interaction into the metaverse. Again, working in the browser, on your phone, no need for any special equipment. You can have a $30 Android phone. You still see exactly this. Look at how beautiful that is. We've now established your real Tim, so thank you. <laughs> and once you have this digital twin, you can actually manifest it in the physical world. And this is kind of part of the future of retail as well. So what we've done here is we've taken an LED wall like this one and another one in the corner. And here we have a customer that's coming into this holodeck to borrow the Star Trek uh, metaphor. And she is speaking to the expert. And on the other side, you see the car in life size. And with a flick of a switch, the same store environment, which is about the size of this box, can become a um, metaversal iPhone store. Here you see an example of a customer walking in. She is going to select the actual phone that she wants. On the top floor is an actual um, ro robotic uh, storage room. So when she's completing her decision and choice, she'll be able to walk out with that new phone in hand. So hopefully you can appreciate that the metaverse represents a step change in how we can communicate. It's very material for the industry that we're talking about here, but it's also very material for some of our retail partners that are reimagining the future of their websites, the future of their stores, and practically every industry is going to be impacted by this metaverse as a service offering so that you can really change the relationship between where the labor is, in this case, the salesperson, the real estate, the unlimited inventory you can offer in the metaverse, both bring that into the physical world and bring the physical people into the digital world to give a better level of support and relationship. Thank you very much. For so this applies to any industry. So there you, you saw me. Yeah, you saw me on this call uh, pretending to be a professor in Harvard. Uh, you saw me pretending to sell cars, and now I'm going to pretend to be a cardiologist. But please do not take my advice. Uh, so you can imagine that if I'm uh, meeting with you as my patient and you have to go through a procedure and I can really explain it to you uh, with this digital twin of your heart and have the imagery on the wall, it really elevates my ability to communicate with you. And imagine that this entire conversation is aided by a strong AI that's kind of human and plus AI that helps me answer your questions. And ultimately, uh, I will be a complete uh, AI version of myself as well. So the triage will take place with the AIs, and then the human will come in and help. Uh, some things will be completely solved by the AI model, but it will be as natural as what you're seeing now. So these are all just stepping stone on that uh, on that <clears throat> of transition from a world that is effectively print, which is what the internet is today. It's a basically magazine <laughs> to a world that's more like the world we inhabit, the world in which you came to this class, the world in which you'll um, meet your colleagues, the, the world of work will effectively go through a digital transition. And in, when it does that, it will be materially accelerated by the, this magically strong AI that's a kind of a co co collective intelligence of humanity. It's really not an algorithm. It's just a co culmination of all of the inputs that we provide. So at this point, I uh, would like to pause and uh, see if we can open it up for some conversation. This is a, an area that uh, does not lack controversy as well in terms of a disruption that it's going to cause but I think it's better to kind of know where we're going and navigate ourselves uh, towards success than to be unaware of, of the, the transformative nature uh, of these uh, disruptions. Okay. That, first of all, that was amazing. I, did you hear me, by the way? Yes. Uh, okay. All right. Good. Uh, that was really amazing. Uh, like, it is a fantastic demonstration. Uh, here, I should probably stand up. Vicky, can we get you to spotlight yourself, too? And we can put all three of us together. And while she's uh, maybe 
doing that? Or? Mm -hmm. All right. All right, so um, let me, let me uh, so the way it's supposed to work is that Vicki's going to look in the chat for questions and I'm gonna come up with questions. And so we're gonna kind of like take your questions. I'm gonna take your questions and she's taking the virtual questions and then I got my own questions on top of that. So we'll have this kind of like multi-way kind of communication going on here. Let me start with one and um, so uh, in, in a way, kind of what you're showing here is all these technologies, like, like if I go back like 15 years, th this thing was basically like a call center. So it's like someone sitting at, at, a, at a phone and the customer calls or whatever, and they say, yeah, I can help you with that. And, uh, you know, whatever they can do just on the phone line. And then I can imagine like, okay, well now we've improved it by, you can see their video. So it got better. And then you take that one more step forward and it doesn't seem like they're at the call center, but they're in the showroom, right? And they're, they're, they can show you more things. And then somewhere in here, you put the AI in and said, well, not only are they in the call center, like, like in the showroom environment, you kind of, with one line of code, you're integrating all this video, everything all together, on the web browser, but on top of that, chat GPT is like helping answering questions that like that one human could not answer on their own. So you've kind of like integrated all of this stuff together. Let me ask the, the first question, which is of all these technologies that are coming together, which one do you think brings the most value to it? Like, do you think the value is in the experience? Do you think the value is from the robot, robotic thing answering the questions. Um, like, where where do you think the value is coming from in putting all this together? Um, so, I, I think uh, this is one of the challenges of a startup ecosystem, uh, which is backed by venture capital. And generally, the way that uh, things happen uh, is that most of the time, when you're setting out to um, start a tech startup. Uh, by definition and, and through the function of resource allocation, you're 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 limited to focusing on one particular problem uh, because ev all these problems are hard. And as a consequence, most of these uh, startup technology companies end up developing a particular feature that their success is an acquisition by a, a bigger player that has the broader ecosystem that allows that particular feature to improve the experience. And the challenge. In, in, in that is, uh, in the context of your question, is that you can't really uh, feel what you just felt when you saw that demo at CES without touching so many of these vectors. And the, the only way to achieve that is either uh, really be very convincing and allow people to let you play and, and, and fail and succeed for a significant amount of time. In the case of TouchCast, we've been at this for 10 years. This is not a two-year effort. And the other, and not less important, is to have a partner first mentality in which you're building on the shoulders of giants constantly. And you're not confused by the notion of what we're building. You're not looking at it through the lens of this is what we do. You're looking at it through the lens of what does the world need? And you're always trying to find the right partners to kind of connect the dots. So, I mean, that's a roundabout way of saying that there isn't one thing that makes this possible. And I would go further and say that even if I was not born, what you just saw would happen. Uh, so the, you, we're all in a stream. We're all in a stream together. And it's true for all innovation throughout the ages, whether it's the, uh, the automobile or the aircraft, these things happen at the same time when they're possible. Uh, so it's, it's really a function of uh, positioning yourself uh, with, of course, the, the the talent and the willingness to work very hard and take a lot of risk in that stream and connect yourself to the right uh, kind of streams of uh, value generation. Yeah. Let, let, let me keep interacting with you on this a little yeah. bit. I think, I mean, your answer is, is a little bit along kind of like, oh, it's really all of these things. And it's not mm -hmm. about us inventing everything and, and, you know, working with all the people who have and, and putting it together. But I think the answer that you're really saying is it's about the experience. Like you're saying that there's an experience that you're getting 
and you're willing to use whatever tool and whoever invented it, but the value is like create, like I could be wrong, like maybe you say, no, no, that's not what it is. But, but I feel like it's the experience and I'm thinking, okay, you've got the, the car shopping experience there and you've like got, you know, or the phone shopping experience, but you know, I'm wondering whether like that probably applies to so many things, you know, that probably applies to like going to the bank instead of like clicking buttons on the screen, you know, and maybe there's like other things that you'll bring in over time, like, um, like, uh, you know, authentication. So like it can see you and, and it can authentic. It's like when you walk into the bank, it, it has a much better feeling of you. And, and, but now you feel like you're at the bank and they feel like it is really you based on all this other information that they have. I don't know. I think you're, you're getting to that. Um, so I, I want to make the question more interesting than do you agree? So hold, hold on. Um, and also you guys should think about questions. And I think Vicky's working on questions, but while they're coming up with their questions, um, I, I'm trying to get to let me let me help. Let me help because I, I think there's a first of all, I'm responding with my, my lens as a mentor to your questions and not with my lens as an engineer. And that's maybe why I'm giving you an indirect answer. Uh, but I would say that the way to think about what I just shared is being students of history and unfortunately uh, uh, of an age where we experienced the year 2000 as, as a mature entrepreneur. Uh, and we saw that the world moved from uh, the physical into the web. And for most of the people on the call, that's like oxygen. And look, they won't necessarily understand what I'm about to say. But in the year 2000, people were very skeptical that anyone would ever buy anything online, that nobody would ever put their credit card in a browser. And then right. they were gradually willing to accept that maybe they will buy books. You know, books, maybe that will work, right? And now, of course, we know where we are. And all we did in the year 2000 is we took our paper catalogs, our Sears catalogs, which we already had, we had mail orders, and we put them online. And that changed the GDP of the world. Mm -hmm. What you're seeing now is the grafting of the physical world into the digital plane, meaning it's not that we're trying to translate something into a catalog. We are literally lifting and shifting the physical world into the digital plane with all of this support. So just like the web two or web one and web two was this fundamental revolution, the web three is arguably more extreme revolution uh, because the labor doesn't have to be where the customer is anymore. And that also manifests in the physical world as you saw with the example of that holodeck. So this is a very profound moment if you look at it through that lens, it's not a it's not an incremental step of technology, and when that coincides with the strong AI, the enabler for all of these things is the GPU technology. That's why we work very closely with NVIDIA. Uh, but the make the building blocks are a lot of neural networks that do a lot of the things you just saw. You don't see them; it's like good special effects. You don't appreciate them, but they're there. There's about 14 neural networks working in concert, uh, 450 gigaflops of compute to make what you saw happen. Availability of cloud compute, all these things are driving the capability and the need to productize it in a way that is easy to deploy, that doesn't have a weakest link. Most of these metaverse approaches require that you put a computer on your nose, which people will never do, uh, or have a gaming PC, which most people don't have. And the solution that we're presenting to the world doesn't require any of that. It works even on a $30 Android phone because it's all cloud rendered. That's why Microsoft is a great partner. Right, because you're doing it all where you are, inside that computer instead of inside On, the, on the cloud, on the Microsoft. Yeah, in, in the cloud. So, you know, the thing is that it can all feel actually a little scary, right? I mean, when you think about like, like just when the internet happened, it's like, oh my God, you know, like, like, there's all these different things that have happened and you can't really tell what the effects are gonna be. And now you're, you're putting so many new variables into the future, as in, you don't know the person talking to you anymore is real or not. You don't know where they are anymore and you don't, and they're working somewhere, but do they have a visa to be working there or not? And how do you regulate that? And how do you pass money around? And, what is legal and not in the old world? And I mean, like you put so many new variables in, into that equation. Um, uh, you know, do you, 
like first like do you have like oh okay i was gonna say that maybe that's a research project all on its own is to come up with all these scenarios of what might happen when you put these new variables in like what do you think is going to happen like are we going to be able to manage all this what should be what should we be like we've inv we're, you're inventing the capability but we don't know what the result of that capability is have you got ideas on how we should manage that how we should think about how to control it so i would say uh to your comment about we're creating the capability, you're seeing kind of the tip of the iceberg, right? And underneath that tip is, I'm sure you, you've all heard that Microsoft just committed to invest $10 billion in open AI, right? So we, again, build on the, on the shoulders of giants as we do this. And we, we, we create proprietary technology because we have to, but we don't do it when we don't have to. And we kind of build towards it. And it is fundamental, I believe, to the, to the future of how the world is going to work. Hopefully, I've illustrated it, just some use cases, but it's going to affect everything. It's just like the web affected everything. If you're a travel agent in the year 2000, sitting in your office and on your keyboard trying to talk to someone about their plane ride, uh, and you don't recognize uh, how the internet is going to change and disintermediate uh, your business, and you don't adapt, you will be out of business in three years, right? So- yeah. You have to constantly be aware of this. As entrepreneurs, it's a massive field of opportunity because it creates volatility. And volatility is when you have the opportunity to create wealth because otherwise the rich people just get richer, right? So, and have an interest in maintaining the status quo. And the folks that are hungry, and I hope that many of them are on this call, have an opportunity to show up, understand where the world is going, and aim for that place and leverage the volatility and the disruption that takes place to create value. Um, and not to confuse the means with the ends. It's really- Yeah, that, that's a little bit of the theme that you had actually all through the presentation, which is don't, you know, if, use it as a tool. Don't like be worried about it and don't try to, it's kind of like your example with like, do you fire the software programmer who used chat GTP? It's like, you actually want to say no that's a good job like use it and and learn to use it don't like say don't use it and don't compete against it and don't say i could do a better job like that would just be like unhelpful um okay i want to vicky's been taking questions or i think she might even want to promote someone up to the screen vicky have i got that right you, you have wanna... it right okay so ah you're up on the screen now all right so fantastic why don't um why don't you bring up a question and then uh, yep. we'll kind of go around. I actually have three people in waiting to ask um, questions, questions that are kind of questions top line. One, two, three. Okay. And we got a few questions here too. So we'll, uh, we'll rotate a little bit. That's fantastic. Sashi, do you want to, um, can you uh, put your video on to ask a question? Fantastic. Yes, yes ma'am. Thanks for this op opportunity, yeah. if I may say that. Okay, my first question I actually want to ask sir, is how to develop uh, out of box thinking? Because if we see from the past, we are the persons to write the history, what the history has been with a pen. And we are actually right now using keyboards to type what the future is going to be. If we, if we say that, do you think we'll, uh, we need someone to carry on this legacy? Of course, we need someone to carry on this legacy of writing in the future. Do you think it's going to be the humans who are going to determine what's going to be happening in the future? if not the AI, and how do you think a, one, a person can develop a out-of-box thinking so that he or she can create something which never has been seen in the world? Yes. That's my question, yeah. So I think uh, I'll give you a bit of a philosophical answer to this. Mm -hmm. We have this illusion that we're individuals with, the, with an id and uh, a, 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 an agency uh, and we invent things where in fact, we're a colony like, a, like ants that use communication as the technology that humans invented that allowed us to conquer the earth and not live in a cave, but rather in, in a house with running water. Uh, so in, I think that recognition, that understanding is almost like a spiritual understanding that you're, you're part of this broader thing. Now, these AIs are that thing. They're a manifestation of human 
insights. They're not an algorithm. They're not that someone's written some robot that knows how to figure stuff out. And what that means is it can only go as far mm -hmm. as the knowledge that preceded it, right? Because that's what it's trained on. So what you're going to see is situations where the, but the thing is, there's such a big arbitrage. There's such a, so much breakage in, in, in our mortality, this, the short time, the fleeting time that we're here, the randomness of experiences and opportunities we're presented with, that a, a, an individual has a limited capacity, right? So because there's so much breakage, this AI looks so overwhelming because it doesn't have that problem. It's, it's benefiting from the knowledge of millions, hundreds of millions of individuals that contribute to it. The reality is it'll con it can invent amazing things because so little has been invented even with the knowledge that exists, but it's not gonna invent the things that will need to go forward. And, and there's a role that humans need to play to consistently feed back into it unless we get complacent and go into kind of a dark age, right? Because then we'll just be in the same simulation. So mm -hmm. there's definitely- you know, actually, Yeah. So, you know, let, let me uh, like, before we take a different question, I want to actually like follow up with what you're saying. Just, just quickly, I want a response to this, which is that, um, and I, we got your point that, you know, the AI is like cumulative and, you know, and it, it has all that capability, but AI, chat, GTP, all these things, they really take human input only. Like they don't come up with anything on their own. They take all the web pages that are written and they divide it all up and then they re then they take a sentence that a human wrote, another sentence that a human wrote, and they piece these things together. And it all seems like it's, you know, magically like, like this incredible human intelligence, but it's all really driven by people's thoughts. The one like really downside of it is if the internet is some gigantic library, that library is like 90% garbage. You know, it, it, there's a lot of like, useless stuff in that library. And that's what we're feeding this AI. So like, can you comment on, first of all, my first point being like, it's not really anything more than human stuff, like just re put together. And two, there's a lot of human stuff that's not that smart. And doesn't the AI actually suffer from that? Yeah, so I, I uh... I have an, kind of an unfortunate answer to that question is the first, you, the way you describe what this thing is, unfortunately, I have to tell you that that's what humans are also. <laughs> and right. in, in the field of neuroscience and the most advanced research done by some amazing people, some of them, my dear friends, we're seeing a convergence that we are actually seeing that this is how the human mind works down to the way the language works and the way that the neurons are firing, these fields are converging. And uh, for those that see that, they walk around a bit uh, depressed because they understand that we're all this information processing machines. So this illusion of agency is, is critical for our survival as a species, but it is an illusion that we're part of a bigger machine. And all of us are just, when Bob Dylan is sitting there and writing uh, a, a song, it's not really Bob Dylan writing a song. It's Bob Dylan has listened to many, many songs and read a lot of things in poems and has had experiences. And he's doing something that's more evolved than what ChatGPT is doing, but fundamentally is very similar. Uh, so maybe that's the role of education to help us separate the less good inputs from the better inputs. I, I know we have in we, we have questions here. Uh, who had? Okay, I'll, I'll come to you. Go ahead. Um, I can, I have two questions. You can choose which one you want to uh, attack. The okay. easier one, obviously. <laughs> first of all, okay. first of all, I really like your presentation, so thank you for that. And I like your Grogu in the background. It's very cute. And uh, my first question goes maybe a bit. Um, Targeting, but I was surprised to hear you say that we make proprietary technology where we have to, because open source is, especially in the field of AI, was proven to have you know developed the field so far, and and so I would just wanted to maybe ask for a follow up regarding that and and maybe an explanation as to what what was meant by that statement, and the second question would be uh, quick answer is what I meant by we 
write code, proprietary code when we have to is because we can't find it anywhere. There is no open source. Nobody's solved the problem yet. So you have to do it yourself because you can't find it anymore. Okay. And this, the, the second question would be, what do you suggest for people who like, engineering students, you know, at home, who are limited to, let's say, one GPU at max two, <laughs> if, if they have the ability and the financial, how do we, um, you know, prepare ourselves for the amazing technology that you showed us in the, in the meeting, you know, um, as, in terms of skill as well, but also having like this broader scope of understanding, okay, I'm studying, I don't know, NLP, computer vision, and and now I finish my bachelor and I go out and, and suddenly I'm overloaded with these millions of vectors of technology that all come into a fiat demonstration. Um, that, that's okay. amazing. Okay, so basically it's how should a student study in, in this complex world now? I, I think uh, teaching computer science is notoriously challenging because of the statements I made earlier. So you have to recognize that what you're studying is how to study, not the material, is how to, how to develop your ability to tackle a problem because and the universities cannot keep up with the pace of innovation. I would argue that industry cannot keep up with the pace of current innovation. The speed we're seeing in AI is unlike anything I've seen in my lifetime. It's on a daily basis, another shoe drops with a foundational and meaningful impact, including in the, in the academic sphere. Uh, so the speed is so fast that if you expect that the courses you're taking in university are aligned with that, you're just, you know, the secret to happiness is low expectations, right? So lower your expectations and understand that that's not what you're doing. You're like uh, going to the gym and running a few miles on a treadmill, you're, you're strengthening your cognitive muscles, you're, you're figuring out how to problem solve, even if you're problem solving with a, what might be an ancient technology by the time you leave school, which unfortunately could be the case, because a lot of things you learn in computer science programs are totally redundant and not helpful to your professional career, but they give you some bedrock. So when I was coming up, I... I'm self-taught, so the only thing I went to school for is art school. But when I was a teenager, I was programming an assembler. And because I was programming an assembler, that gave me a native understanding of computing that has created my ability to do everything you just saw. So I, I, and I, the comment about the GPU, not that relevant because we've already gone through a revolution that this idea that you have a lot of data and you train yourself is supplanted by these massive models that only the tech monopolies can run because it costs a billion dollars. So these models can do so many things. There's so many things that you can now build on top of these things that haven't been even imagined yet that are relatively easy to do. Like we were dealing with how to summarize a talk like this using a neural network for five years. We were building proprietary technology because nobody solved it. But now you can spend one day, do a few API calls to GPT-3 and summarize this entire talk into bullet points in one call, right? So it changes very quickly. So you want to understand the macro, understand that you always, it's going to be a lifelong learning experience for you. It's not like you're going to get your certificate or you're going to get your thing and you have what you need. You're just starting and you're always just starting because in this field it never stops moving so it, it, in a way your answer is don't worry about it use it all as, as practice to sharpen your mind and then you're back to use the, the most advanced tools just be open to if the tools change you use your sharper mind and but you don't have to know every single thing in the world you just i get right are, are you saying that you're, you're saying pick your problem Use yeah, the best yeah. tool. Don't worry about everything else. If you, if you learned how to program Java, and I, I feel sorry for you if that's what you're doing right now, uh, <laughs> then you'll know how to approach learning how to use Python, right? Because you've you've done something harder, right? So, 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 so these tools teach you how to learn. They don't teach you how to use the tool, and and that's it's important. It creates these patterns of thought in your mind that will make life easier for you in this space in the future. Um, here, let's 
let's take one online and come back over here. Vicky, yeah, I just I, I just wanted to highlight something about what you're saying. We've had a number of students say, what should I be studying? You know, what's the best career path? But I think what you just said is super important. It it it, it matters how you use it. Um, and, and finding patterns. So I appreciate that. I am hoping that Andre um, Sergio, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, can ask their question next. And yeah, I'll go ahead. Yes. One thing Hello, that would be nice, you. we have people from all over, let us know yeah. where you are. I mean, there's a Gobia right now in Spain, in IE. <laughs> He's at another campus in, in the same, over here. Thank you for promoting me. My, my question is, um, so the, the technologies you just showed us earlier are truly amazing from a technological perspective and they can make the way we do things so much more effective. But from a human perspective, I mean, we've evolved for, for thousands of years to being used to see things and hear things and smell things. And we've been, our brains have been wired for real life, physical human interactions. How are these technologies going to take into consideration that and like what is the chance that chance that maybe people are going to reject this because it goes so much about against our human nature. Sure, um, so I, I think uh, humans uh, optimize uh, for minimal energy to achieve a goal right, which is another way of saying humans are very lazy. Uh, does that make sense, so if I. Uh, enjoy walking into a store and trying out uh, six types of shoes and walking out with the shoes and going back home, uh, I might enjoy more clicking a button, getting the shoes, trying them out at home when I want to, and if I know I can return them, right? That's just an example of, uh, of an analogy there. So what, what humanity does is it tries to minimize the amount of energy to achieve a, a particular objective. So if these technologies will help that, then humanity will embrace it. And when it doesn't, it won't. Um, and in some ways, digital communications have consistently throughout my life reduced the fidelity of communications. Meaning if I was sitting in front of you right now in a Starbucks, I would have a better fidelity broadband communication with you, right? Than I would over Zoom. Uh, when we talk over text, it's alienated us from many of our friends, as opposed to even talking on the phone. The technology I just shared with you today, from my experience, is actually the first communication technology that I've experienced that actually elevates my ability to communicate with you. And what I mean by that is if I'm trying to sell you that car, I can be more efficient as a communicator in that metaverse showroom than I could even in a physical showroom, because I have infinite inventory. I can show you all the different types of cars. I can show you how to charge it because I have a charger where you don't have them in the dealership. So there's all these different things that I can do that really enhance my ability to communicate better than the physical world. And that's where there's value to, to this as a communication technology. Um, and it, it's not, I don't believe that people will just live in the metaverse with VR headsets like Ready Player One. I think it's a totally irrelevant uh, technology right now. I, I don't see anything on the horizon that solves for that. But I do believe that what I just shared with you is a representation of the next medium of communication that we're going to use as humanity, right? Just like we all use Zoom during the pandemic, right, as an enabler, this is the next step. And when you couple that with the AI revolution, you can see that it's bigger than that. It's like what happened in 2000 with, with, with things moving to the internet. Okay, okay. Um, and and I, I like that answer, like that we'll basically... It's kind of like we all want like more dessert and less spinach. And so we'll just keep doing these things. I hopefully all that dessert doesn't kill us. But anyway, we'll we'll just kind of be, find the things that we want to do out of the options. I think that's a good one. I'm going to take both here. We're going to listen to a few questions in the interest of time. And then the one that is the hardest, you answer that. Okay. <laughs> so. All right, um, what are, tell me your questions. Yeah, sure, um, so my name is Shema and I just like wanted to switch a bit like the perspective from which we're seeing now like the problem, but I wanna uh, rebond on like the idea that like tech ventures like now are kind of like very focused and narrowed on one like specific special like feature they can build. Right. It's like very hard for startups to tackle like a big problem, especially like in the tech space. 
So my question is, since in general, they're only building one feature and then they're like the end part would be like an M&A or like getting acquired by bigger right. companies, then what would be like the most pressing issues, like features that like maybe tech startups or like young um, entrepreneurs or something could look into um, uh, now? I mean, like the most pressing issues. Okay, so uh, don't answer yet. We're, we're going to take all, all the, the points right now. But your your question is it's partly a comment and partly a question. Your the comment part is ventures are somewhat narrow, and I wonder, like in a way, you're saying I wonder how really big problems get solved because the ventures can't like take on everything. They have to take on their thing with a working model, business model, all that kind of stuff. And then your second question is basically, what would be a good venture? Uh, that's a hard yeah. question for yeah. anybody. But thank you for phrasing yeah. it well. Right. Yeah. Okay, go ahead with your question. Yeah, my question is kind of like a follow-up to the question that was just before hers. Uh -huh. So a lot of people think about the metaverse and they get very intimidated because they think, you know, AI can take everything over and whatever. But we also just saw in Touchcast's example that there was still the human element involved, okay? Which I you Everyone yeah, welcomes. Right, right. So my question is really, is there a pattern in regards to where people need or want that human element? Um, when you think about the metaverse or artificial intelligence and how we relate to it. And is there, I guess, potential opportunities that might come up with this new enabler that we have? Yeah, okay. And so her her point, the, my translation of her point and question is that um in in the technology you're showing. Maybe you're actually putting more human elements in than, you know, like the other technologies were kind of reducing away the human element, but maybe this one is actually putting it back in. Um, although to the point, Zoom put some back in and it just wasn't enough. You know, people really just don't want to sit on Zoom and talk to each other. So that one wasn't enough. And maybe it, <laughs> okay, all right. All right. Okay, he's obviously preparing for an answer of some yeah, like, Okay, so we're gonna, so we just gave you all that input. Why don't you answer either, how do you take on big problems or how did, is, is humanity coming back? Just answer like some version of this. Well, I, I just from the last topic first, is anybody interested in a motorbike? I have, uh, I have <laughs> off road bike, I, I get commissioned. So I, I, I wanna always be selling. <laughs> um, I think the this, crash in real life, right? Yeah, the technology uh, is meant to solve a problem, and in this case, the problem is I'm trying to sell you this motorcycle, and I might be Triumph, the motorcycle company, or I might be a dealer. That uh, so, let's say I'm a dealer, and I have a store that sells Triumph motorcycles. So, in the past, you bought a motorcycle for me three years ago, and now Triumph has this beautiful electric motorcycle, right? And I really want to call you and, and tell you about this amazing machine. I know it'll bring a lot of joy to you and I will make a living. And how would I do that today? Well, I would need to somehow call you and say, look, uh, Jane, there's this amazing new electric bike. You should really come check it out. And you need to find your time to come down to the dealership to see it, right? Uh, so what this does is allows me to send you a text message and on your phone, you're here with me and I'm showing you this bike. And if you tell me that, you know, you don't like this color, I, uh, I can change it, uh, for you. Uh, let's say you want, uh, well, that's the other bike. Uh, I can change it to different colors, uh, and I can, uh, go through this with you and say, okay, this is going to cost you this much. Come and get by it. So it's, it's, it's a communication technology, right? And it, and that it promotes, uh, the human connection. Now, Apple was a failed company. Apple was almost bankrupt. Uh, the thing that made Apple successful is when they shifted from making computers to making communication devices. Because humanity needs communications. It goes back to my metaphor earlier about us being a colony. And if you support communications, you will be rewarded because that's what we need. That's, a, that's why Facebook is so successful. Uh, so... I would say in the question of asking what, what should you do, I think the first thing you should do is find something that is meaningful to you, that is that you will feel looking back at a lot of hard work, chewing glass, you know, looking over the chasm, which is what startup, startup life is, that after you suffered for whatever amount of years it is, it was worth it. 
that you felt that the work was meaningful. And you need to look at your value system and apply yourself in a world where you think will be valued. Now, that doesn't mean that it needs to be philanthropic. It just means that you want to look back and see that it's useful. Now, my comment about the niche or the narrow solutions was more of a comment about what we do at TouchCast. It doesn't mean that these narrow solutions don't have value. They have tremendous value because they solve problems that nobody else has solved. So I don't want to communicate that that's a bad thing. It's just a reflection on what we did with this. And I, I, I earned the right to do that because I've built a lot of companies and I sold them and I was able to go on this journey. And I was you know, crazy enough to convince other people to give me their money to, to continue on this path. And honestly, even as amazing as what you just saw is, the company is always an endangered species, right? It's just the nature of being in this kind of life is being able to live with that uncertainty and take those risks consistently. Hans, one, uh, excuse me, uh, Ido, yeah. Hans asked a question that I thought was kind of interesting. Before yeah? you ask it, I think we should watch out for the time. And I feel like we've probably even gone beyond what Ido originally uh, agreed to. So can, do you think that maybe this should be our final question? I don't want to cut it abruptly, but I think this might be, uh, what do you think? Well, I'm sorry, not Hans's question, no. um, because he just asked, what about how you feel on that triumph, like feeling no, I, the motorcycle? I, okay, so, <laughs> so you're saying, okay, so that's a quick question. You're saying maybe that and another, right? Okay, fine. Yes. So let's insert that one, do one more, and let's see if we can get some sort of good rep. Maybe, you know, somewhere in there, before you close it, your comment could be, what's the world going to be like in, in five years? But Start, let's start with how do you feel on the motorcycle? Like, how do you, uh, you know, copy that feel? It's different having a cycle, being on the actual cycle. Um, I, 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 I don't understand. Yeah, hands. You your head. Hands, <laughs> hands, if you played video games, um, <laughs> like, I don't know if you played Call of Duty, you kind of felt what it looks like to be shot at, or if you play a racing game, you kind of felt what it's like to drive. So that's really where the metaverse has lived. It's not a new idea. It's uh, it's just the fidelity continues to improve, but it's never going to replace getting on that motorcycle. It will replace a dying a very painful death when you <laughs> become a ball of fire. Um, <laughs> so... So we have a question online from uh, Gaia, but also you probably have questions over there. Um, Gaia's question is about one energy one. consumption. So you all choose what you want to finish with. What we can take your question. Gaia, can I ask you to um, basically turn on your video? Hi, everybody. I'm zooming in from Berkeley, California, and it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Ido, for your presentation. Uh, yeah, my question was, I'm, I'm fascinated by all of these advances in technology, but I was also wondering if you have any concerns related to the environment, because these are also relying on machines that consume a lot of energy and are made of hardware that is really hard to recycle. So how does your company... Um, address this issue, if at all, and how do you think technology advancements in general uh, can cope with this? Sure. So uh, we've actually spent a lot of uh, time on this because one of the things we did during COVID is we uh, we basically did all these events for really the world's biggest companies in the metaverse. So just like you saw me earlier in the Harvard environment, uh, we would do these events with CEOs of companies in an environment like that with the camera work and we ran these really massive virtual events. And one anecdotal example was we worked with Macquarie Bank, which is the biggest bank in Australia. And throughout that period of time, which was close to two years, they've, they've, they've basically grafted many of their physical events uh, in uh, the metaverse. And we worked with an external uh, consultancy that specializes in carbon offsetting. And we, we did the studies and we calculated, we actually invested in creating a calculator. It's on our website where you can plug in all the parameters and you actually understand that if when you do a physical event, the amount of carbon uh, that is created is very significant. You know, everybody flies from all over the world, everybody goes to hotels, they eat food, all this stuff. So interestingly, the the just one of their big events, we did the calculation, uh, the, the amount of uh, carbon that uh, they did not put in the atmosphere because they did in the metaverse was equivalent to the amount of carbon that all the trees in Central Park in New York, which is a lot of trees, would have absorbed in seven years. 
So it, it that's just very anecdotal example. So the and, and and I would say further that the challenges we have as humanity are not going to be solved uh, by anything but technology. Like that's the only way we are going to work our way out of the holes that we've dug for ourselves is using technology. And I think the fundamental technologies that will do that are going to be accelerated by AI. That just accelerates our ability to solve the problems like fusion energy or whatever it might be. So in some ways, it's the only way out of this crisis. There, so the notion that we would kind of, uh, you know, uh, abdicate the use of technology because it uh, uses an energy that creates a problem it would be very self-defeating because it's literally the only way out. That's a really good quote, by the way. <laughs> we're we're, we're going to capture that and attribute it to you. But um, only technology can solve the problems to some degree that either people or technology have, have gotten us to now. Although, you know, there's an alternate quote somewhere that a, no problem can be solved by the same thinking that created it. So, like, we got to put those two together. Um, but I like technology is the only way out. Technology is the only way out. We'll, we'll go with that. All right. All right. So, um, you know, uh, you know, I think we stretched your your limit on on your your kind of the welcome that you're giving us with time. I really I don't know what screen to look at anymore, but um, here, right here. yeah, okay. No, I know that one, but I gotta kind of look at him too. So, um, so I just want to say I um, really appreciate you taking the time. You are virtually all over the world. You're talking to everyone. You've you worked with, uh, you know, really some of the the most famous and brightest people in the whole world. We've got all of that those like wavelengths and thought processes, and you're synthesizing them all. And you're putting them into the to your work, but you're putting them into the ideas that you're giving us back today. Uh, completely appreciate. Uh, taking the time to do that. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I, I appreciate uh, illuminating this stuff. Uh, and uh, if anybody has any questions, drop me an email at edo at touchcast.com. Happy to help with anything. And I think I'll leave you with a poem that uh, I asked Chad to <laughs> write. Uh, yesterday, uh, you know, there's one field that's always been amazing to me, which is text-to-speech. Text-to-speech is the ability to take text and make it into audio. And it's it's been incredible to me because I realized early on that it's much so much more than the words. There's so much encoded in how you say things that's not in the words. And uh, a couple of days ago, I finally arrived at a solution that I I thought, oh my god, this and it keeps getting better. But it was amazing. So I went to ChatGPT and I said, please write a poem about this idea of, how, of really realistic text to speech. And he it wrote something. Said, now tell me, give me an optimistic view of how AI would impact our future, which is kind of consistent with our conversation today. So I thought, I'll play this for you. And what you're going to see is an image that was generated by DALI. So the image is synthetic. And you'll see the query on the screen, which is really two queries that I gave to ChatGPT. And I basically just put that into this text-to-speech engine. And it created this voice. And you'll hear the music in the background. And, and hopefully, uh, I think you were saying earlier, Victoria, that it's a bit scary when you hear it. And I, I attribute that to when you experience this, it's a bit like touching something spiritual because it's this collective unknown. It's kind of like touching God in a way because it is all of us together making this, but it is also really kind of uh, ironic, reflective, postmodern that this is the technology talking about itself and how it wants to see itself, right? Across the lens of these challenges. So, uh, with no further ado, it's a, it's a bit long. It's like two minutes or something. So. Uh, but it's I thought I, I found it moving. So before before you play it, before you play it, um, I just say for all those of you who are watching, we'll use this like the credits going up on the on the screen. Thanks for attending the very first session of this kind of global catalyst impact series. And we're gonna end it with the poem written mm -hmm. by Chat GPT, if I've got that right. A poem GPT about TTS, text-to-speech, once a robotic sound, with monotone voice it made us unbound. But now it's changed, so rich and so bright, with emotions so real it gives us a fright. It speaks with such depth it's hard to believe, 
that it's not a human so full of soul. The sadness it shows, the joy it portrays, makes us question our own in such amazing ways. Human nature is unique. We thought that was true. But as technology evolves, we find it anew. The lines between man and machine start to fade as artificial intelligence begins to invade. The future is uncertain. Where will we go? Will we be replaced by AI? Who will know? But for now, we'll listen to text to speeches. The voice, once flat and robotic, now conveys a range of emotions that one could never dream. And in its depth, it makes us start to muse on what it means to be human or just a machine. For as it speaks, with every word it brings a sense of life and soul that's truly real, and we begin to wonder at the things that technology can make us feel. We question our own nature and our fate in light of this new form of artificial grace, and wonder what the future may await for those who dare to seek a digital embrace. For as these machines grow more advanced each day, we see the lines between us blur and fade, and we're left to ponder in what way AI will shape our world, our lives, and our ways. So let us use this gift of tech with care and strive to balance man and machine. For as we forge ahead in this great affair, we'll find a future filled with wonder, hope, and peace. With AI at our side, we can overcome the challenges that face us, big and small, and unlock solutions to the problems that numb our minds and hearts, affecting us all. No longer will we struggle to find cure for diseases that once seemed so incurable. With technology's aid, we'll find the pure and simple answers, making them all attainable. And as the earth groans under human strain, with AI we'll learn to live in harmony, reducing waste, preserving land, and reign in balance with our planet's majesty. With AI we'll find peace in our strife, and bring an end to wars that waste human life, as nations come together free from grief, and work as one to solve our global crisis. So let us embrace this gift with open arms, and use its power for the greater good. For AI will light the path to many charms and help us solve the problems of our world. Yeah. All right, that was awesome. <laughs> and uh, I, I can already see that it's gonna become my psychologist's future. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's really astounding that so many of the themes of- We're, we're not here, we, we lost your audio though. <laughs> it's a bit too muffled you might not get saying that it's so uh, yeah. uh, how much of uh, of what we just heard was the subject of our conversation and it was all what the ai came up with right so it's yeah. just, just it's kind of mind-boggling it, it is and at the same time it's because it took all those human thoughts and and filtered them, right? I mean, whatever was written already, yeah.